We talked about how the CI pipeline is akin to an assembly line. Securing that software factory involves more than traditional application security testing and basic access controls. A single platform with end-to-end -end controls and visibility can greatly simplify the task. A common compliance control that is becoming more and more important is code signing. You can sign the code with GitLab, but if you want to go a bit further, Venify will show you how. In this next session, you'll learn how to certify your code and artifacts with our technology partner, Venify. Eddie Glenn and Laurent Domenech will discuss how applying these added controls can better protect your customers from a software supply chain attack. Hi everyone, welcome uh, to today's session where we're gonna be talking about how code signing can be used to help solve, stop software supply chain attacks. My name's Eddie Glenn, I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Venify. I've been involved in software development for about 30 years now, started off my career writing safety critical software and then moved into DevOps. And uh, most recently, I've been helping customers uh, secure their applications. And I'm really excited to be joined here today by Laurent, uh, who's a uh, principal software architect at Venify. And Laurent, can you say a few words about yourself, please? Hi, I'm Laurent Domenech. I'm principal architect at Venify. I'm responsible for the design of the infrastructure at sales or cloud product. I'm a software developer for about 25 years now, um, initially work developing enterprise and integration products. And for the last five years, I've been working in cybersecurity software. Thanks a lot, Laurent. Uh, let's get started. So software supply chain attacks, they're on the rise. I mean, we've seen solar winds in the news recently, code cub in the news. And if we just go back just a few years to 2019, many of you may not have heard about Link OS. Uh, they're a small Ukrainian company that was responsible for uh, about $10 billion of worldwide damages when hackers broke into their software and infected companies like Moeller Maersk, who's a global shipping conglomerate, as well as uh, companies like Merck Pharmaceuticals. So these software supply chain attacks are a really serious business. And uh, as a software developer, you guys really need to keep this in mind. And, and that's really the whole point of our presentation today is to talk about steps that you can take to help pre prevent these kind of attacks. But besides what happened at uh, Link OS, if we looked at just the damage from solar winds, uh, estimated that it's impacted about 18,000 of their customers and uh, several of their customers were very large, notable uh, U.S. government agencies. And uh, it's been reported that uh, the U.S. government has set aside about $500 million to handle the damages from that particular attack that was done through solar winds. So definitely, you know, this is, this is a pretty high consequence type of attacks. And uh, as software developers, it's really important to take every step uh, possible to help prevent these kind of attacks. So before we get started, let's um, talk about just you know, software releasing. And uh, in the old days, it was, it was pretty simple. You wrote software, you pushed it out to your customers. Uh, in the day of uh, the age of the internet, things started to change and, and attackers would literally try to insert malware into the code that, that was released and then that would infect customers with malware. And uh, the industry responded by introducing something called code signing where a, a security team at a company would digitally sign a piece of software, and that would have a couple of consequences. First, it would ensure and it would protect your customers. It would allow them to know that that software did come from your company and that it wasn't uh, someone else impersonating you. And then secondly, it would ensure uh, your customers would know that nothing has been done to tamper with that software. So it would prevent malware from being inserted into it. So basically, you know, we would code sign release software once it got out to, uh, to uh, the, your customer base. And in fact, um, code signing was so effective that it caused hackers to change how they uh, attack companies. And we talk, talk about this as, as shifting left. So instead of trying to attack the final piece of software that's been produced and already signed, hackers are now starting to target the software build environments, so the actual build process. And this has had a lot of impact on, uh, on software development. And as a seasoned software developer, Laurent, 
Uh, what are some of your key takeaways from these attacks and, and what should software developers be concerned about? The application security landscape is constantly evolving. Um, the focus was initially on the edge of the application. Security testers are trying to find vulnerabilities in the web interfaces and APIs. Then it shifted completely left, um, you know, trying to find vulnerabilities in the source code and, and third-party dependencies with static analysis scanners, dependency trackers. Nowadays, these tools are completely integrated with developer day-to-day -day workflow. But with the recent, the recent attack you mentioned, it's clear that it has shifted again, this time focusing on continuous integration and continuous developer pipeline. This is where we need to pay, uh, focus our attention. Excellent points, thank you. And uh, you know, one of the things that's different than when I first started writing software is that today's software is a lot more complex. And it used to be uh, when, when I started off writing software, you know, we were responsible for writing all the code. That's not how it is today. And uh, if we just look at any type of uh, release software, we've obviously got the parts that we're responsible for writing, but then a lot of it is coming from open source code. It's coming from third party libraries. And then when we look at our build environments, we're using lots of tools that are coming from third party, uh, third party vendors, either SaaS kind of tools, or they might be on-premise tools, but they're responsible for the software development, the software infrastructure testing environments and so forth. There's also now build and infrastructure recipes. So, you know, we're dealing with infrastructure as code as infrastructure and, um, and build environments as, as, as code. And we've got build scripts to contend with and then even our deployed environments are no longer physical environments necessarily. They could be uh, things like containers, uh, Kubernetes and Docker. And this is all code and, and as, as a result that could uh, be potentially tampered with. So we're now looking at not just a single, single thing that's being attacked, but when we look at the software build, uh, build pipeline, there are lots of opportunities for hackers to, um, to start to attack. So, Laurent, one of the questions that I have for you is, you know, we talked about just a few minutes ago what traditional InfoSec used to do, you know, and we, you know, they would sign the release software right before it got deployed out to customers. How's that changing and what's the impact on, on software development teams? Nowadays, development teams are responsible not only for writing code, but also for testing and, and building it. Security needs to be included that. Uh, and developers must work with those infosec, those security engineers to protect all these steps. Good points, thank you. So one of the things that Benefy did after uh, it became uh, public that uh, we had a, a pretty large breach at SolarWinds is that we reached out to some of our partners in, in the security and software ecosystems and we started working together on, okay, what are some of the best practices should uh, software organizations under, undertake to help prevent these kind of attacks uh, from, from uh, happening again. And Laurent, I know that you were a big part of this project and it's a project that's still ongoing. So I'd like for us to spend just a few minutes and, and you tell everyone what's been involved with this, this blueprint and, that, and that's what Venify has been calling it as a blueprint for preventing software uh, pipeline, um, build pipeline attacks. So yeah, let's spend just a few minutes and talk about that. Um, yeah, initially this blueprint was built for securing our own Venify cloud pipeline. Uh, we then you know, worked with other security vendors to make it a recipe that can just not be applied to our, soft our pipeline, but to most software pipelines. Um, this, uh, this blueprint is now open source and we welcome contributions to it. It's really designed around the set of control based on, on lesson learns from recent industry security incidents, but also from traditional methods to protect production systems. Uh, for example, in, in this diagram, you have control four. It's your traditional least privileged control. Um, you know, your build server, they need to access your source code. For that, they need to have, they should have no more privilege than what in the, it's required. But um, and most of the time, read-only access should be enough. If your, another example is your build server may need to create uh, tags in your source code. Um, in this case, you should just grant this level of privilege and try to avoid at all time full write access. Um, another example is the control 15, which you know, actually is not even in a, in a diagram, is an additional uh, control in the blueprint. Um, and this one is about applying container technology to pipelines. Every step in your pipeline should run in a container. Uh, once the step is finished, your container is discarded. Um, that could prevent malicious long running process like we saw in, in, in SolarWinds. Um, even if a hacker is able to install the process in your build, 
that process will only run within a container, so it will be limited to, your, uh, you know, to what you can access in your infrastructure. And on top of that, it will be very short-lived. Uh, another interesting control is control five. Um, it, it, this one recommends that you retrieve dependencies only from local registries. You know, in, in, in your in your in your infrastructure, in, in being in on premises on the cloud, it means that your build won't be able to pull dependency from public sources. That way, you can control that the dependencies that you you're pulling they only come from upstream registry that are known to have strong security policy and traceability. Uh, the last type uh, of control in this diagram is all about fingerprinting and consigning. We're going to talk more about that. Great. So, so this, this is really useful information. And uh, I just wanted to point out the URL that's on the bottom of the screen here. And uh, Venify and our partners really encourage you to uh, go out and, and visit the, the GitHub repository that contains the information uh, for this blueprint and contribute to it. Because uh, we, we know that as, as hackers change their uh, attack methods that we have to keep up and, and everyone in the industry has to keep up. So we, we expect this to be a living blueprint that can constantly uh, uh, be updated to, to stay ahead of, of what's happening. So one of the things, Laurent, that you mentioned is that code signing is a key control throughout the, the build pipeline. And uh, I think, you know, as, as we um, think about this, and, and, and I, th I think I heard you say that before you move from one part of the pipeline to the next, you should, uh, if you check something into the repository, you should, should run that through a security scan, then sign it, and then at the other end of, of that particular uh, component is that you uh, would check to make sure that that artifact had been properly signed. So I, I guess the question I have is what kinds of security checks should one run uh, for when they're checking something into a repository, you know, and right before they go to, to sign that particular artifact? Start with your stat static analysis tool that scan for vulnerabilities like SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Uh, and as modern software relies more and more on open source, you should also be using a dependency tracker that will analyze all dependencies that you have in your code and check for if they have dependencies that have known vulnerabilities. Finally, don't, don't forget to run your quality and style linter. Those are very useful as well. Interesting. So, you know, I think one of the, the key takeaways here is that um, you know, in the old days, we might sign code once, you know, every time we release it. But now that we're looking at signing different kinds of artifacts throughout the build process, and, you know, if people are following DevOps, uh, then likely that build process is happening many times a day. Uh, so that's going to mean an increase in, in the, the need for doing code signing. And uh, I think that's a good segue into this next topic, and that is, what are some of the challenges that developers have with code signing. And, and, and this is really important for us to think about, especially if we're expecting our developers to do more code signing to, to protect the software pipeline. So I'd say that the biggest problem is that, you know, I certainly didn't have this when I was uh, doing software development, that is PKI experience. And code signing is, is, uh, is about PKI. So uh, if we're expecting developers to understand PKI and, and certificate management around the code signing certificates, they just don't necessarily have that level of expertise. So that kind of leads to the next, next uh, bullet point here, and that is, well, if the developers don't have it and then the InfoSec team or the security team needs to do it for the developers, are there problems associated with that? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, usually uh, the security team operates at a much different time frequency than development teams. You know, in, you know, in the development team, we're talking about frequent releases that are you know, happening all the time. Security teams are all about Let's slow things down, you know, make sure the process is followed and policies are followed. And, you know, did you fill out this form? Did you get this approval? That sort of thing. So these are often at odds uh, with the development team. So what, what happens as a result of that? Developers usually take things into their own hands. So they'll fill, figure out, well, we're just going to do this ourselves. We're not going to involve the security team. And that leads to a whole different set of problems. Um, first one is, uh, private code signing keys, and we didn't really get into a lot of detail about code signing, so if you don't have that background, that's, that's probably okay, but there is this one aspect of code signing, and that is it requires a, a key. So it's a, it's a secret that no one should have access to, and if, if someone does get access to it, then that's how they're able to code sign in your name. So these private keys need to be protected and secured, and frequently what we find when we talk to our customers is that 
their developers put these in all kinds of interesting places. Usually it's places that are convenient for them. So if they need it during an automated build, where's that key located? It's located on that, that automated build server. Uh, maybe it's on their laptop. Um, one of the examples that I didn't talk about earlier was, was a computer company called Asus. And they had a, a similar kind of software supply chain attack a few years ago. And it was discovered that their keys were actually, their code signing keys were stored on their web update server. So a hacker broke into the web update server. They found those keys on that server. They were able to insert malware, re-sign it with that private key, and then got, that got pushed out to their customer base. Other issues that uh, are kind of related to the fact that software developers frequently don't uh, have that PKI experience is that they may request a code signing certificate from a, a certificate authority that's not authorized by the company or is out of policy or the certificate was configured incorrectly. And these causes, these cause different kinds of problems for, uh, for, the, for the software. They might be using wrong configurations or doing things like not using a time server. And, and that's probably a topic for another conversation, but a time server is, is a parameter for code signing that, that ensures that the code is going to continue to run even if the code signing certificate expires. So these are just lots of problems that developers have. And um, as Venify thinks about you know, this, this market problem, and as we you know, started to address it with, with a solution, um, we really focused on you know, what do developers need. So before I move on, I'd like to hear, Laurent, some of your, your experiences. Uh, I, you know, I'm curious, have you experienced these kind of things with the development teams that you work with? Uh, in the past, I, I completely avoided code signing tools because I found it difficult to, to use them. Uh, you need to create encryption key pairs, as you mentioned. You know, you store them in a, in a private key in a, in a secure way, which is, you know, what's a secure way? Um, and then publish the key uh, to the registry being internal, sometimes public registries. Um, and then you need to configure your, your, your the entire tool chain to use that. That's not easy as well. And, and on top of that, you need to rotate those keys every few months, you know, for, for following good practices for security. Honestly, most developers, they are not encryption experts, uh, and they should not be. Um, the software, you know, should, should be very simple to use. Good, good points there. And it's not only uh, developers that have issues with this, it's, it's also the InfoSec team. And, and, you know, I know that all of us that are developers at heart probably, you know, think a lot about what, what the InfoSec team goes through. But if you put yourself in their shoes, they're, they're dealing with things where you know, they're still responsible for company security. And if they know all of these things are happening on the development side and they don't have visibility into it, it's really hard for them to understand what the risks are. So they're concerned about things like private key sprawl. And that is, you know, where are those private keys at that are being used throughout the software development process? Uh, do they have the ability to enforce a code signing certificate and, and key policy? Uh, you know, they're experts in security, so they know what hash algorithms should be used. They know which certificate authorities should be used. Uh, and they really are out of control. They have no ability to, to be able to uh, enforce those kinds of things. They also uh, may not have insight into how different artifacts are being signed. And, and again, just you know, to, to reiterate this last point, but they're still responsible for the company's security. And so this really creates a problem for an organization no matter if you're on the development team or you're on the, the InfoSec team or you're the CEO of the company. These things need to fit together. And uh, as I'll, I'm gonna talk about just in the next few slides, very briefly, this is how Vinify is addressing this, this particular issue around code sign. So we have a solution called Vinify Code Sign Protect. And basically we looked at three objectives. We want it to be extremely fast for developers. We know that you're doing lots of releases and you're signing lots of different artifacts and it can't slow down those automated builds or those automated processes that you have. And it has to be extremely easy for you. So it means that you don't have to go in and modify a bunch of scripts or you don't have to learn new tools or learn anything about encryption or certificates or anything like that. It just out of the box, it needs to be just extremely simple for you. It also needs to address some of those problems that I just talked about with the security team. It needs to provide them things like visibility. It needs to provide them a way to enforce policy and process without encumbering the development teams. And then it also has to, to be designed to, to be able to protect software supply chain attacks, 
which means it has to be flexible. It has to work within lots of different kinds of development environments. It has to be able to work on signing different kinds of artifacts, be it uh, source code or, or libraries or executables or, or you name it. Uh, it. You know, if it's a piece of software that gets executed, it needs to, to be able to support the signing of that, that particular kind of software. So what are some of the things that, that CodeSign Protect has? First and foremost, it's integrated with the tools that developers use. So as an example, GitLab, uh, from right within the GitLab environment, uh, it's, it's very easy to just uh, have a, a build pipeline created that does that signing for you so that you don't have to think about it. Uh, you might be using more tool, more environments besides just GitLab, GitHub or Jenkins, or you might be developing Java or Windows executables or Linux executables or, or uh, iOS applications or, or Android applications. CodeSign Protect supports all those environments and it, it provides those same kind of features across all of those different environments. So your InfoSec team has visibility into all the code signing operations that happen no matter if it's source code that's being signed or some other kind of intermediate artifact like a build script or an executable. And as a development tool, we, we took the approach of it needs to be uh, uh, API ready and uh, have a full API that allows complete control and automation over what CodeSign Protect does. That in, in ensures that it can be integrated into any kind of software development pipe, pipeline or process. And then from a development benefit perspective, it basically eliminates the need for you to have to know how to access a key or which key should be used or which certificate should be used. That's all handled behind the scenes. And just the fact that you're logged into a, a specific machine, uh, CodeSign Protect will know what keys you, should, you have access to and which should be used for this particular purpose. And then last, and this is really key, is that there is never a need for a developer to actually have access to that private code signing key. So this really helps with the security of your code signing infrastructure. Those keys are always protected in some uh, protected trusted storage, either in protected by, by hardware encryption or maybe software encryption. But the point is that it doesn't matter if you're doing a build by hand and you're typing a manual command uh, at the command line, uh, or if it's part of your, your build, build pipeline, those keys never have to leave That's that encrypted storage. Uh, so they're gonna stay very secure and away from hackers being able to use. So I really enjoyed talking to you today. Laurent, I'm really happy that you're able to join us. Uh, I just wanna emphasize a couple of highlights, um, things that you guys should take away from, from the session. First and foremost, attackers are shifting left. You know, they, they know that code signing has been effective and it protects that final executable. So they're going after your build environments. They're going after the way you, you develop software. And you need to be prepared for that. You need to take measures for that. Uh, as as uh, Laurent talked about uh, with, with our blueprint for protecting the software supply chain, a lot of the control measures are required and they all need to be handled by the software development teams. We talked about how code signing is, is effective and it could be effective throughout that build pipeline. You, you just need to sign intermediate artifacts along the way and you need a tool and a, and a platform that's gonna be able to support that without causing any additional burden on your software development teams. So with that, I wanna thank you for joining us. And Laurent, do you have any final uh, words of wisdom for, for the audience today? Yeah, thank you, Edith, for having me. Um, those are very serious attacks. Um, as developers, we need to understand how they to place and we need to learn from them. Uh, we need to be involved with securing applications, not just leave that to the security expert. And the best way to do that is work with them, with the security expert in your organization to, to, do, to protect you know, their software. Thanks a lot, Laurent. Uh, final thing for everyone. Um, we do have this really interesting artifact that, that uh, the Venify uh, Threat uh, Analyst did, created. It's basically our, uh, our research into what happened to SolarWinds. It's a really interesting read. It's a really short white paper. I suggest that you download it uh, after the after session. Thanks, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit.